Welcome everyone um, to Access to Perspectives Conversations. Today we have Laurie Hark as our guest and I'm very happy that she agreed to share with you all and me um, her journey so far as you're probably familiar with, with her as the former funding director of ORCID, um, the persistent identif identifier for researcher IDs basically, which enable you to do a lot of things um, that facilitate also open science practices and that kind of thing. Um, but that's not the end of this, or that's not her whole career so far. Um, Laurie is an entrepreneur, a strategist, an author, and also a researcher. Um, she is very much community oriented and practices in areas such as social tech. So, social tech, entrepreneurship, research infrastructure, nonprofit governance, decision frameworks, and also product strategy. Um, she's recently, fairly recently, found in Mighty Red Barn, which we're going to hear more about what that entails and the, um, yeah, the wonderful things that um, are going to come out of it. Um, so yeah, despite the being the Funding execu executive director of ORCID. She also had leadership roles at Thomson Reuters, um, the US National Acad Academies, Academies, excuse my English, and um, Science Ma Magazine, as well as uh, volunteer services and nonprofit boards, and um, served as the SCORE small business mentor. Um, yeah, she's a recipient of the NIH Director's Award and the Veach Medal of Honor. Um, Rory, you also did your bachelor and master's studies at Stanford University in biological science and um, neuroscience, respectively. And you worked as a postdoc at the United at the US National Institutes of Health. What a career so far, and much more to come. <laughs> so welcome again very much to our podcast. And um, yeah, um, so where shall we start? Yeah, so thank you for the intro and thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. And um, I'm wondering if we start um, with what you talked about with community and collaboration, you know, you do so much work yourself in creating and supporting communities of open science. And maybe we can have a bit of a conversation about kind of how we see each other's work too, right? And how what you've been doing has influenced me and vice versa. That might be a fun way to go. Yeah, that, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for that. And I'm very keen on hearing and also exchanging around this world. What does collaboration mean for us? What is a com what is a community? Maybe for those who are not quite sure how we define community in our respective contexts, and um, what communities we've um, been members of and parts of, as well as facilitated and grown and fostered ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, in terms of collaboration, is a it's a really interesting word and i think um i think the base of collaboration for me is respect right this idea that you can work with somebody else but that work is foundationally based on respect for the other person the other person as a person the other person as a part of many communities that you may or may not ever know about um, but the other person also as an intellectual uh, being right that has things to bring into a conversation um, and i think there's also a respect um, not just for that but also for being able to question right being able to question and it's very very difficult to have that questioning um, if there isn't that base of respect upon which you can build trust that when you start to question and say, I'm not, how, well, how does that work? And how does this piece work? That is coming from a heart and a solid place rather than a, an attack, right? So collaboration has to be, has to start with respect, build up trust, and that takes time. And so I think there's um, that time aspect is the part that's problematic for many people, right? Taking the time to build the relationship, to build the respect to understand different communities and the places people might be coming from, but also for those of us coming from those different communities to 
have the respect and trust, right? Uh, necessary to be able to say, hey, I, I need respect. This is, this is how you show respect to me. And this is a little bit about who I am so you understand what I'm bringing into this conversation. And, um, and that's tough. I mean, I've done, I mean, some aspects of the work, and we've talked about this as well, of, of coming into communities where you are not known, but also coming into communities where my culture, the way that I was brought up, my experiences are, are not necessarily irrelevant, but they aren't the same. Right. And being able to acknowledge I am now in a community where I am an outsider. And I have to figure out how do I bring respect into that community in developing that trust and collaboration. And that is a long process, that building trust process, in particular, when the community um, that I'm working with has been in um, poor trust relationships outside of their community. That's really, really tough. And I know that's something that that you have certainly encountered in your work with um, with Africa Archive. Um, it's something I'm encountering right now working with indigenous communities, right? Of communities that have had trust broken every step along the way mm. and coming in as a non-indigenous person. Um, it's, 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 um, it's, it's always a challenge, right? Building up that level of trust and being able to figure out what is it that I have to offer into this community that this community would find valuable and taking the time to figure that out. It's not easy um, and it's not always linear. It's very iterative, um, but that's, um, that's also part of collaboration. I think if we have that intent to work together, taking that time to go on the journey um, can, can happen. And it's incredibly powerful when it does. Yeah, I agree. I've also worked with indigenous communities and I have quite a few indigenous friends and that was really an intense lesson for me. It was like about a decade ago and still going. Um, and I think it prepared me well for my work with Africa Archive because I learned empathy the hard and necessary way, like to, to yeah, like you described, to acknowledge the pain and suffering not only the individuals we engage with but generations of their families and communities have been through um and the collective trauma that they experience almost on a daily basis and still facing um yeah, racism and um marginalization and all kinds of um human rights violations really um and in, in my work now with Africa Archive, it's partly also that because we, we, like, we look at a lot of indigenous communities on the continent and also a researcher's community across the continent as diverse as, as it is, which keeps being neglected or the, what's the word? Um, yeah, not given the opportunities that other regions or other researchers and or researchers in other reg world regions might experience and being being offered, mm -hmm. and that's what we try to solve. And yeah, like what you described, I also question myself every day, and it's painful. And I still I wouldn't say enjoy, but I still see it necessary. Um, yeah, because we cannot know because we're not in their skin, we're not in their yeah. shoes. Yeah. Um, and how is it still possible to function as an ally and to, yeah, to be a friend and a facilitator in, um, of conversations for them to speak on their own behalf? And I think this is also what we share the, um, in enjoying to utilize a mix of human skills and technical skills to yeah. catalyze for that. Would you like yeah. to explore on that? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And and I was just thinking back on my career and kind of this, you know, thinking through the different communities that I've been part of and that I have joined. Let's say that. Um, and and you know, even starting off as you know, in in my generation in the United States, so I grew up in the U.S. Um, I was the kind of first generation of kids whose moms, right, um, had to deal with uh, male and female job ads, 
right? So if you were a woman, you looked at the female job ads. I mean, gender, I'm like, really? And my mom had to quit her job when she was a teacher when she got pregnant because you couldn't be an obviously pregnant teacher, right? So this is what my mom grew up with. And here I am in the 70s, we had something called Title IX that made it much more accessible for girls to do sports, for example, at school and a whole variety of other things. So this was happening uh, when I was a kid. So sports were just starting to become available to girls. Um, and all of that turned into me, um, you know, that had a huge impact or effect on how I interacted in the world, right? So a big part of my, my early career, my early life, I'm going to say kind of, you know, teenage through probably 30 was really pushing for the inclusion of women in the workplace and particularly women in the scientific workplace and saying, we are here, we are intelligent, we are part of this. Um, and so I feel like I've had some of that experience of trying to push into, but at the same time, realizing that what we're pushing into is not really what I want right? That culture of the academy of working super long hours, not being able to enjoy family and friends because you're supposed to be working 90 hours a week doing these experiments where you don't get vacations, where there isn't a human resources department, um, where there isn't a easy, you know, a way to go say, look, I'm being abused here, right? That wasn't right. And so that kind of first experience for me going through now, it wasn't the undergrad part, um, it was the post the graduate school part um, of realizing this isn't the community I want to be part of. Right. Um, and at the same time, saying as a woman in in science, getting this message um, that if you drop out, you fail as a as a symbol of a woman in science here, you've been fighting this whole time, right, to be part of this community and you can't leave because now you're part of this leaky pipeline syndrome. Um, and so it's, it was really tough to say, you know, all of these, you know, you start off in a family and then you find family, kind of you're forced together in a found family in college, but you're there because you're a roommate with somebody. And then you go on to, for me, to graduate school. And that's when you start to actually look at finding and creating a family, that community that we're talking about and realizing it isn't the community you wanna be a part of. And then saying, how do I wanna change it, right? How should this be changed? And I think that's a lot of where you know, looking, looking all the way back from Orchid, a lot of what I did at Orchid was because of these experiences, foundational and formational experiences I had kind of as a kid, but also as a woman um, looking for family and community in graduate school and saying, I'm not seeing what I want here. I want to do research, but I don't want to do it like this. And that wasn't specific to my lab or my university. It was just kind of that was how research is done generally, right? Yeah. And that's what I found out over time is, you know, you have all these people complaining about their situations, but moving from grad school and then postdoc into Science Magazine and doing some of the work that you've been doing about how do we talk about the career opportunities for doctorates, right? Folks who have a PhD or a PhD equivalent. Um, and the opportunities I had to talk to this vast array of people who were doing really, really interesting things where they had said, I'm not going to be forced into this family that people say I should be part of as a PhD. I'm going to go find my family and find my community, find my jam, as you like to say, you know, and really look out there and see what works for me, right? That doesn't mean I'm a failure. That doesn't mean I'm part of a leaky pipeline. It means I'm using my skills in a career that suits me. And because it suits me, I can also then give back to the community, right? I think that was one of those big learning points for me was going from my postdoc, having interviewed at a lot of different kind of research opportunities where I would continue doing that basic research or applied research in the case, because I did also look at some um, industry jobs. Um, and then moving from there into Science Network, which is uh, now Science science Careers, I guess it's called, and doing that work um, in the post network and realizing, wow, 
this is just so much closer to what makes me happy. Um, and I'm able to support research careers, right? And support folks doing better science um, and having better communities and doing science, but also saying there's so many other opportunities out here and sharing that. So that, that was really, I think, formational for me to, to really think about that found family aspect of it. Say, I'm doing what makes me happy, and that is a good thing. <laughs> that's yeah. okay. Yeah, no, that's great to hear. And I could see myself also in some of the scenarios that you describe. Um, I was doing my master's degree in Stockholm, Sweden. And um, and then we had, in the laboratory I was working, we had guest researchers from Spain. And the first thing that I observed and encountered was the Swedes. They show up around, well, between 9 and 10 a.m., and they leave again at 3, 3.34 because that's when they fetch their children. I haven't seen that in Germany. And yeah. the Spanish were like, oh, these people have equipment. We have to make use of it. So they were the first ones to shop in the lab on a Monday morning at like 7 or 8 a.m. and wouldn't leave the lab before 10 or 11 p.m. Mm -hmm. to make the most of, of the facilities that they could, you know, during their stay access. So that also um, brought to my attention the, uh, which is what, well, the inequality, the in, inequities is the word um, that exist in the system on a global scale inside Europe already, and which I think also I'm now so passionate about research equity and global research equity with Africa Archive and also other um, underfunded regions. But also inside Germany, I've, you know, there is an imbalance in how research funding is being distributed across universities and research institutes. Um, but now with your work at ORCID, um, how, how do you, could you explore further and how your experiences that you've observed have influenced the, the milestones that you define for your team? And maybe also, um, I don't know if that's widening the scope too wide, but um, also coming back to the community and collaborative aspect of your work at ORCID. Um, and was it easier or challenging to motivate your team to create an organization for um, attribution um, or, well, what is it really? <laughs> um, what ORCID provides with a identifier on a researchers and individual level, um like how do you think your experiences how would, how would you describe your experiences have influenced of what orchid nowadays provides as a service to individual researchers male female and also on a global scale yeah so i mean i, I i'm gonna go backwards a little bit and then forward so um so i would say um a lot of kind of you know starting with science to the National Academies, to the startup, and then, and then Thomson and Reuters, a lot of what we did was uh, research policy work. And a lot of people would say, oh, this isn't working, period, right? And then you'd hear the same talk five years later, this isn't working, period. Oh, we don't have enough data, right? And I think this is where, you know, this, this idea of entrepreneurship comes in as well. And this interesting, in a way, culture clash between entrepreneurship and scholarship, right? Where in scholarship, you continue to want to dig in and dig in and dig in and get perfect information, right? And there's research where you're continually making experiments to try to figure out something, right? And iterating through things. And then you have this concept of a startup that involves both this scholarship, trying to understand what is this problem you're trying to solve but also bolts on or, or integrates this concept of research, which is iteration, right? I don't know exactly how to solve this problem, but I have some ideas, I have hypothesis. And so I'm gonna try a few things and see where that gets me, right? I have this vision of what I wanna solve, but I can't, I don't know exactly how to solve it. And so I think ORCID came out of that, right? Where you had the example of, for example, Thompson Reuters setting up researcher ID, you had Elsevier with their um, scholar ID, you had a variety of different identifiers across communities from publishers to societies, et cetera. And, and um, they didn't all work together, right? And so you would go through this whole 
you know, process of trying to what's called disambiguate the names in your systems, right, to, you know, get all the Lori Hack records together. But as soon as you added a new record into the system, you had to do it all over again. And so everybody was in pain. And, um, and so the commercial entities came together with the nonprofit entities like the universities um, and the repositories, these, these um, entities that usually don't get along at all, right, <laughs> are finally mm -hmm. saying, in order to solve this problem, we have to work together. And that's what I loved about ORCID, was this idea of a found family that got together for mutual self-interest. Totally works for me, right? Everyone's got a stake in the game. And um, they know that if they can put down everything a little long enough to be able to work together and form something that they all could benefit from, the world would be a better place. So for them, you know, even if it's self-interest, right? And so into this, you know, I had been, um, you know, doing a variety of things. And again, for me, the background was always, I would like to make it possible for all of the people who participate in the research process, whether it's the principal investigator, professor, um, statistician, the postdoc, the grad student, everyone on these projects to have their contribution acknowledged. And what I saw kind of growing up in that environment was um, the inequity of, of credit, right? Mm -hmm. so you have, you're talking about the inequity of equipment and facilities. I saw the inequity of credit, yeah. right? And that both of those things come back to who gets funded, who has access to the equipment, um, because they've gotten funded, who is able to tell the story, which comes back to equity in communities, who is up there on the dais telling the story matters a lot. If I see, for me, again, with my background, if I see a woman up there, I'm like, yay, there's finally a woman telling a story about what's going on in science. The same is true for so many other communities, right? I want to see somebody like me too, having made it, to be able to tell the story, but it's not even just that. It's saying it's not just one person who made this happen. It's a whole group of people who made this happen. And how can we make all of those contributions visible and make it more understood that to get that one person up there telling the story, all of these people had to contribute, right? Um, and so I brought that with me into ORCID to say, this isn't just about the technology of an identifier for me to have that I could use as I do my work, right? It's about me getting credit for my contributions, big and small to a project, for that to become visible and for that to then change the way we understand and do research. Right. So that's what I brought in was kind of that that a bit of a zeal in changing the way research is done. And I think that became um, it, it was more easy to have a rallying cry around that vision than it was around, oh, there's this identifier. We need to build a, you know, blah, blah, blah system. No, it was we can change the way research is done. So it does become more equitable more accessible and it does attract people into it because for however long they're part of the research system they get credit for the work that they've done not just only credit when you're the principal investigator but you get credit for every piece of the way right that's what i was trying to do at work it and i think that's what was able to motivate the team and also motivate others um, as early adopters who got that who understood that's really the crux of what work it was about um, so I don't, you know, and, and also when you're in a startup, I mean, up to that point, I had been in startups, but they had already started up. I'd been in really large organizations. I'd been acquired by a really, my organization had been acquired. I've been part of a merger and acquisition process. Um, I had been part of sunsetting an organization, you know, so kind of all the <laughs> steps along the way. And ORCID for me was this, for me personally, was this wonderful opportunity to actually participate in getting an organization started from employee one up into starting up and launching. That was for me just a wonderful experience. Um, and uh, so I, it, <laughs> 
anyway, so in terms of motivating the team, a lot of it was also finding people at the beginning when we're just starting that loved working in a startup with, you know, 100% uncertainty, right? When I started, there's no employee handbook. There's no, there's no benefits package. There was none of that. It's like, hey, Lori, we have salary for you for two years, right? Uh, not quite sure where this is going. Go for it. You make it happen, you know, and the board had done amazing work with the principles, they put the bylaws together, the governance structure was there, it had been incorporated. So kind of the, the process pieces of it and that foundational element of what ORCID was and the bringing the stakeholders together had been done, right? A lot of that community work, getting people to understand kind of at its nature what the promise of ORCID was, right? I came in on the operational side and said, okay, how are we gonna actually make this thing work? <laughs> Right, you can talk about vision all you want, which is great to have one. How do you actually launch this system? And so it came in in April, and um, I got my tech person, Laura Paglione, on board in June. Yes, and um, we launched the system in October that year, right? And um, and again, it's not like there hadn't been any of the technological work done. Jeff Builder um, and others had been working with some uh, donated uh, code from Thomson Reuters, actually. Um, but getting that launched open to the community, that was a roller coaster ride. And, um, you know, if you ever get me and Laura on a call, we'll tell you the story of the day of the launch. But, you know, having people like Laura, right, who get startups, who are willing to work in uncertainty, and then building the team bit by bit, again, with people who are, who get uncertainty, who thrive in that, um, was fabulous. Right. Mm -hmm. And getting the early adopters on. I mean, when we launched the board, we had a bet the day of, of it and we went out to dinner at the board and they're like, okay, how, how many people do you think are going to register in a certain amount of time by the end of the year? I think it was. And, um, the, the first, it was like, it was in the 5,000 range. Oh, we think maybe, maybe we launched in October, maybe 5,000 people by the end of the year, eh, maybe, maybe 8,000. Right. Well, we had 5,000 people in the first week. <laughs> right. And we had 50,000 by the end of the year. Right. And the board was like, oh, right. Total just. And that was even with kind of a, a really kind of crumbly user interface. Things weren't, you know, we weren't expecting as much traffic. It was 2012. You know, cloud servers weren't then what they are now. Load balancing, all this other stuff. But we made it work. Um, and by the end of the next year, we had a million people that had signed up, right? And there's now over, it's, I think it's getting close to 12 million <clears throat> researchers of some stripe have signed up for, for an ORCID identifier. So, yeah, it, it's been, I think it's that, that for me, it's that coming in with this great big wash of uncertainty, trying to figure out how do you prioritize what you work on, right? What's the thing that's gonna get the next thing to happen? And if something fails to not worry too much about it, learn from it and then go on to the next thing, that's that research mindset in software development world, it's called agile. Um, experiment, find out, learn from it, keep moving. Um, and we were just really, fortunate to be able to attract some wonderful people in to help with that starting phase. Yeah. That's, uh, that's lovely to hear. What do you think was the tagline that convinced the users into adopting ORCID at this early stage? Like from yeah. my personal, just, you know, from how I saw ORCID, and I think I registered when I was still a PhD student, it was like a, dec oh, no, a decade ago. Um, and I was like, oh, there's there's like an identifier which says they're like publisher independent cross like you can use it to sign up for not one, not two, but multiple digital services that are relevant for scholars like researchers in particular. So that seemed like, yeah, like a democratic approach, which was until then only available from a publisher centric approach, which is not bad in itself. It's just very biased. 
by its, in its nature. <laughs> right. And I think if it's if the way that we looked at it was, um, and I think the publishers even at the time was, even if it was publisher centric, it was one publisher and then another publisher and another publisher. So each mm -hmm. publisher had their own identifier system. So from a user perspective, if you went to journal X, right, with publisher X, right, you had one way of managing a profile, you had to manage mm -hmm. a profile for the publishing system and for the journal. And then when you went to a new journal, there was another publisher, right? And you had to sign up for the journal and the other publisher. So now you have four profiles out there, mm. right? And as a user, you're like, well, I don't remember my, my username and login for all this. So you keep creating new profiles and the publisher systems just can't manage. And, you know, they were trying to figure out a way to deliver content, right? If you can't tie together all the papers that an author has you know participated in it's really difficult to deliver content effectively right so there's a there's both this disambiguation problem this person one person has four profiles right but also the how do i deliver content in a meaningful way to the community uh, from the publisher's perspective and from your perspective it's the pain and agony of having to sign into these stupid mm -hmm. systems you know and so orchid provided a way to say hey you can use orchid as a kind of single sign-on methodology that all of these publishers and journals could adopt. So as a user, you only had to have one username and login to get into any of these systems, right? You'd still use the security of those systems, right? But you're using that single sign-on methodology. And so I think, you know, back to your question of what was the thing that got researchers on board, there was no one thing. Hmm. And I think that's been, that is the challenge with large initiatives like Orchid, where you're dealing with multiple stakeholders, right? You've got researchers that you need to sign in, but you've also got all of these different platforms that need to integrate Orchid. And the researchers' use of Orchid is then seen through the lens of the different platforms they're trying to gain access to, right? And so the message for using Orchid might be slightly different or very different, depending on what context the researcher finds themselves using it in. Mm. Right. So is it, hey, use Orchid as a single sign on so you can submit your paper easier. Right. Is it, hey, use Orchid because now you can find all your stuff really easily on the Internet um, or whatever system you're in and enhance your uh, professional profile. Right. Um, is it use Orchid and get credit for everything you do. Right. These are subtly different messages that you're getting and some in the case of single sign on a very different message, easier access to these platforms versus, hey, um, people will know what you do on the Internet. Right. Or on whatever system you're in. Very different message. Mm -hmm. And so different researchers responded differently and different and researchers would respond differently based on the context that they were in. And so one of the challenges that we have and continue to have at Orchid is what is is it possible to have a singular message mm. for researchers? And I personally think the answer is no. And I think this is where that collaboration, you need to emerge those messages for the different contexts that researchers find them in and make sure that the offering, that technical offering meets the need of that user in that context. You can't just have a single one size. Fit. I don't think you can have a one size fits all. Yeah. Was there one one feedback you received from the users and early adopters or later adopters that surprised you? I was like, well, I didn't see that coming, but that's actually cool. Yeah, and I'm trying to think. I, I remember we had one one conversation. It wasn't surprising, but it was I'm gonna say it was a little frustrating for everybody involved in the conversation. There was a so folks wanted Orchid to be a profile system. Okay. Now, at the same time, right, Orchid is, you know, we had six people working for us. When we launched, we had two, three full-time employees, three, um, which turned to four by the end of the year. Um, so, you know, we weren't big. We had the scope of we're providing an identifier. Our scope was not we're providing a profile system. And from my previous work, I knew that trying to set up a profile system even at one university was uh, hard. It's really hard. At one university with one language, right? Really hard because you've got all the different 
schools and disciplines represented at that university. And on top of that, you have the different career stages and the different tie-ins to the university systems if you're a grad student versus a full-time staff member or a faculty member. And you've got the different motivations and contexts of all those different communities. And you're trying to set up a profile system with established, here's the picture, but here's the sections. When you talk to humanities and basic science researchers, they do not agree on what your profile should look like. So now you start going, oh, I got a profile system, but I have to customize how it works for these different parts and different and different stakeholders and different user groups, right? And I'm going, oh, no, 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 no. Because that's mm -hmm. just at one university. That's not at two universities. And that's not even just in one country. ORCID is a global system with all these different languages. And if we try to take on becoming a profile system, we are, we're going to have massive scope creep away from trying to do this persistent identifier piece, right? So there is scope creep, cost expense, and on top of that, there already are profile systems out there that researchers use, whether it's LinkedIn or a host of other ones, right? They're already out there. So what I, you know, where we got to with this whole thing was use whatever profile system you want to use, but those profile systems should integrate ORCID. Right, so that your ORCID ID is associated with your profile, wherever that is, whatever it is, and that it can use the API to help keep your profile updated because that was a pain point, maintaining your profile on your university or whatever website. So that's the direction we went to try to say, how can we get those systems to integrate ORCID, maintain the scope of ORCID, but also not kind of step on the toes of these other systems, whether they were commercial or nonprofit. Um, and get them to do the integration of ORCID. We thought that was a much more powerful way to support the community than to build own. But it was a very frustrating and I think still ongoing mm. conversation with the community because the community wants ORCID, this open, whatever, you know, platform to also have an open profile system that's not owned by, you know, anyone. It's owned by the community. Um, and so I think there's still discussion to be had there and maybe over time ORCID will decide to go more into you know, providing profile like or destination type services or not? We'll see. I mean, that's always an ongoing question there of what they want to do. Mm. But ORCID is like also how I see it like a venue for early adoption of the interoperability of the various persistent identifiers that we now see. Um, yeah, being in existence, like also ROR, ROR yeah. for institutions and to then really interconnect on a global scale what scholarship. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think that that idea of what's called the PID graph, right, the identifier graph that enables you to say, here's the data set and here's um, a person and here's a repository and the organization the repository is at. Um, and here's where the person's organization is. And here's other papers and being able to use those persistent identifiers to tie things together. And I mm -hmm. remember you know, having one slide in my deck where we had, you know, because we're ORCID, the person was always at the center. <laughs> Right. And so we had our pig graph with the person here and all this other stuff the person could be connected to because of their use of I, their persistent, their, sorry, their ORCID identifier, but also connecting their ORCID ID as they submitted a paper. So now you have a, an ORCID ID and a DOI stuck together, or as they submit their database, now you have your ORCID ID and your database DOI. And then, you know, putting your, um, organization on your ORCID record. So now you have a person and the war tied together. Oh, yes. And, you know, it's the glory and wonder of all of those things connected together. And it's really wonderful to see those things coming together um, and seeing the work that data site and CrossRef are doing with event data and making that event data open, mm -hmm. available to the community to study and understand and hopefully also to inform credit-based systems, right? All these connections can come back and, yeah, and assist in the kind of uh, transformation of the research ecosystem so that these contributions and activities of individuals are um, visible and acknowledged, yeah. Yeah, uh, we're, we've been talking for more than 30 minutes already. <laughs> <laughs> let's keep idea. going also yeah. we can then afterwards discuss how we if we want to divide this into mm -hmm. two or three episodes or we can also pause at some point for a couple mm -hmm. of days or weeks and then resume whenever but i'd like you to i'd like to take you up on what you just said and 
now that we're basically have laid or you and others in the ecosystem have laid the foundation of creating that digital infrastructure to facilitate global research exchange or research exchange and knowledge exchange on a global scale and also um, uh, recognition and attribution for everybody's contribution to the knowledge systems that we are creating in academia, um, yeah. which again gives more discussion ground um, for what is academic knowledge and what other knowledge systems exist and how can we make those complementary? I'd love to take um, mm -hmm. a deep dive into these corners. Um, so, but yeah, now looking at a global research infrastructure technology wise, and also facing a pandemic and or being in the midst of a pandemic and climate change and forced migration for whatever reason, political or um natural disasters which again most of which these days are probably caused by climate change um how do you see well uh, i think the question i'm really asking do you think we as a global scholarly community are smart enough or as a global society with other stakeholders in the boat are smart enough to utilize these opportunities to our very own benefit and yeah, so other creatures. Is, yeah, so it's interesting because um, when I worked at the National Academies, um, the the you know we had there was actually studies done on you know how do you do studies, right? How can you bubble up or across the best advice? So the National Academies in the United States is um, chartered by Congress, right, um, to provide advice to Congress, but academies also provides advice to a host of other organizations. And the question always was, who is the best suited to sit in a room or whatever and figure out what should be done to answer some of these questions, right? So there's always that, okay, who do you invite onto the committee, right? Mm -hmm. Who do you invite to um, to talk to the committee. Um, and one of the committees um, I helped form was a, you know, usually committees are about 12 people. Um, we did a study on women in academia, which was like, oh, you know, exactly what I always wanted to do. And doing it at the academies means people are going to read it and pay attention. Um, and um, Donna Shalala, if you know who she is, used to be head of um, Health and Human Services. Um, president of University of Maine, but she's a really amazing person, got together and we did, so she was the chair and we had a committee that was um, 11 of the 12 people were women, which is unheard of at the academies. Usually it's all men and one woman, right? And um, these women were presidents of universities, heads of, of, you know, corporations. I mean, these are really, I mean, these have made it, right? And um, that was the big deal about the report. Oh my God, how can you have all women or almost all women on your panel? Um, it, in 19, whenever that, when, what is it, 2006, this was a big deal, right? Um, and so I look at this and say, who do we invite to the table? Um, and then who am I to be the person inviting people to the table, right? Um, and so, there's another paper I wrote just recently with Laura Paglione and Heather Flanagan actually on how do we develop trusted infrastructures. And Laura has this really great line in there about experts doing experty things, right? And I think this has a lot to do with, with pandemic and how different communities have, have responded to and managed pandemic. Um, is if you just have researchers or academics in a room you are missing a lot of other perspectives and contexts. And it's very, very difficult to understand what those are, to integrate those into the solutions that you might develop. Um, and I think um, it can look quote unquote elitist if you just have one group of people coming up with a solution for everybody. So I do think that academics, because of the deep, um, deep work that academics do, are, they have to be involved in thinking through and coming up with approaches and solutions, right? I think you also need somebody with a researchy type and entrepreneurship type um, approach as well, realizing that we're never going to have perfect information and we need to take this iterative approach to solving problems. We also need the other stakeholders and affected parties in those conversations. 
And we need to find ways to make those conversations, conversation spaces happen. Coming back to what we talked about at the beginning, right? How do you enable both that invitation? Well, of the, not just both, the invitation, the, the respect, right? Across these different groups, as well as the trust building that's necessary. And as I said, that takes time. And when you're in a pandemic, like what you don't feel like you have is time, mm. right? You don't feel like you have the time to do that. And, and so then what happens is you have these in groups talking to each other, trying to come up with a solution. And this in group comes up with their solution. And then there's another in group that comes up with their solution and on and on. And it's like a whole bunch of sports teams mm -hmm. that are all out there fighting with the other sports team and can't possibly agree that these sports teams both have something good to bring to the pitch. And I think that has caused more time and energy trying to undo that than if we had taken the time at the beginning to build those communities um, and bring all of the experts together to try to figure out okay here's what we think is going on how can we work together together all together to come up with some solutions to these problems that we see mm. um, and that's a big part of what i'm working on now is to kind of say here's all of this work that you know i've been engaged with in the past building communities building communities of practice bringing together stakeholders trying to understand who the stakeholders are continuing to add on to that and then you know creating those found families um, and finding ways to develop respect, sometimes failing, learning and trying again um, to bring people together, um, not even at a table, just to bring people together to have these conversations. Um, yeah, and it's hard work, but it's really, um, I learned a lot and I love it. I absolutely love it, yeah. Mm. I think what you described just now is the typical research workflow. Have a theory, oh, must work like this. Like a uh, hypothesis, try is like, oh, didn't turn out quite a, as I expected. <laughs> okay, let's try again once more, five yeah. times more, 10 times yeah. more. It still didn't work, but it must work. And then you get it right, or you think you get it right once. Okay, how did I? How did I manage? I and then you try to replicate, works. like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I know. I, yeah, we're just like, ah, right, yeah. And then but like, if you invite others to the table who have a different viewpoint, they might be able to point out the mistakes and the best practices earlier in the process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, like, what I learned as a scuba diver, I thought that career would never end, but I paused it. And, but anyways, that's a that's a drama in my life lifetime, <laughs> but it's to be resumed. So what you learn underwater is, you know, if you panic and then try and find a solution out of panic mode, you probably die. Right. So what you need to do is actually stop whatever you're doing, stop it <laughs> and then breathe secondly and then think. And only then as a fourth or fifth step act. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it was funny. It reminds me of when I was in grad school, one of the people in the lab next door to mine was, um, he was really good at just saying, Lori, take a breath. And I love that he did that because he didn't just say breathe, he breathed. And then his act of breathing and saying breathe kind of oh, slows you down a little bit and gets you to breathe to do exactly what you said. It's, it's difficult to think if you're hyperventilating, you know? So mm -hmm. um, yeah, and just take a little bit of time. And it's interesting kind of also looking at kind of building communities and even the differences between like working in the United States and working in Europe, um, very, very different approaches where the United States is like action, action, action all the time. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. And when you're working in Europe, it's much more stakeholder building, understanding feels much. It feels more consensus driven than the United States does. The United States feels more experimental and willing to make mistakes. Right. But then you're going to make some mistakes where Europe feels much more. We're going to get this right before we launch anything. So it's like the speed of, of action and the methodology of action is different. And, um, and then, you know, getting into different types of communities, um, 
you know, thinking about, you know, who talks when um, mm. it is also interesting, who sits where, um, paying attention to those existing community uh, positions. All of that's present, right? So when I work in the United States, I inherently know that because I know it. But then when I start moving into communities where, you know, they aren't white, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. They didn't grow up in the suburbs. Um, it's really me having to take that breath and pay more attention to how do these communities knit and, you know, this community knit together, but also how can we bring different communities together? And again, coming back to that, how can we show respect for each other? And how can we tell each other how to show respect, right? for each other in these rooms um, without having to repeat over and over again or without one group coming in assuming that everyone else knows how to deal with them, right? Mm. So being explicit at the beginning with these, this is what I need to be able to participate in a conversation. Um, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's fun and hard. Yeah. Like one attitude we're trying to change with Africa Archive is also the assumption of those who are underprivileged have only the learning seat to take instead right. of being at the table to contribute just as much as those who are privileged and come with all the equipment and the money. And it's, well, I feel like from observations, the the bottleneck is really the time scale or the time pressure to accomplish a project within a certain time frame. And there's hardly enough time or willingness from some of the stakeholders um, to sit and listen. How do you do research with the equipment and the challenges and opportunities that you have in your research environment? And how can we make best possible use to well, first learn from each other and then utilize the materials that we now have an opportunity to bring into this project to learn together. And yeah, and maybe also redistribute um, budget items because there's a learning curve on both ends or sh yeah. should be or can be. <laughs> um, and also like I've, I've also see, heard also um, African colleagues so are being told or also think, oh, there's uh, partners with the money and we have so much to learn from them, not realizing on what kind of a treasure box of knowledge and experience they're sitting and also being shy to unleash that or to put it on a table and, and present it proudly yeah. or you know, self-conscious and self-aware and self, what's the word? Yeah, in a proud way or on a, uh, like as their ownership that they contribute to the project. Um, and I think yeah. like also ORCID is for once a week for that. And also what you explained in your approach for collaboration and respect for each other and a readiness to listen and learn from each other and then balancing what's available as knowledge, as access to the regional context or experiences, um, and then create something that's the essence of a project, right? Create something together to solve. The, Sorry. Yeah, and I think one of the challenges in, in you talked about shy or uh, shyness, I think, um, in working with um, indigenous communities right now with the local context project um, is is also this in some ways unwillingness to come to the table on the part of some of the indigenous communities because their work has been um taken right mm -hmm. it has been um appropriated and um and uh you know in even in the act of a researcher coming into a community that the way that intellectual property works right is the researcher who collects the information owns it right and this to me in my head very in a very simplistic you know it feels a lot like what motivated me in in what i talked about earlier with orchid is this idea that the pi gets all the credit for something but there's so many other components of this project that made it possible and so i think it's going to be difficult 
I guess what I was hoping with ORCID was that it would it would be part of that respect equation because people are attributed for the components of the project, people and organizations are attributed for the components of the project that they contributed, right? Um, and I mean, that was actually one of the questions that got me so interested in, in, in kind of this next phase of work that I'm doing is somebody came to me and said, Lori, ORCID is all for people, individuals. What about communities? What about communities that produce something? How would ORCID handle that? And I'm like, well, ORCID does individuals, right? But in some communities, the concept of individual doesn't really exist. The community is more important than the individual. And I'm mm. like, oh, thought about it that way. And so that gets into, you know, how, how then is that managed? But, you know, it comes back to your, your statement about how can we get people to come together on an equal footing? Right or on a, at least an equal respect footing, right? Mm -hmm. And that's there's that equity component, equity of access that you've been working on with that archive, but also that equity of attribution, equity of ownership, equity of um, of of kind of that intellectual property component, or you know, you know, which says I'm at the table what I have done is seen as worthy by everyone. Mm. And it can't be taken from me. People know that I did this. My community did this. This is our contribution. I think until we can get to that point where contribution is acknowledged, right? I don't think we can get to a way we can have respectful collaborations. Um, and I think to your other point of the time and the, what we've been talking about with time is that we have to make the time for this because we do as a society, as a global community, have some grand challenges, right? You know, it's not how to make more tasty flavored gum, right? We're <laughs> dealing with some pretty serious issues here of, of you know, how are humans going to continue to exist on the planet? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do we care, right? Maybe we don't care, um, but uh, I'm saying that, you know, but that is the crux of this. How are humans going to continue to exist? And there's so many parts of that. We have to do with climate. It may have to do with um, pollution. It may have to do with population, blah, 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 you know, access to food. So many dimensions of that. But I think at the core of it is this question of do we care? if humans continue as a species on this planet. And if mm. we do, then we need to make the time to treat each other each as humans, <laughs> right? We're all mm. have, you know, are on the ground here and trying to figure out how to live. And we all need to be part of this conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I had this image when you talked about um, self identity versus collective identity. Well use other words but and i i was imagining a, a envisioning a tree in a forest and then like as it often happens the forest being cut down and then one tree being left all by its yeah. own you yeah. see that quite often on agricultural context um and what's the worth of that one tree when we think about oxygen production photosynthesis like and also biodiversity and whatnot and I think that's also what I learned where, from engaging with indigenous communities and indigenous representatives. It's, 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 first of all, it's about basic human rights for existence and also about collective ownership and the sense of collective ownership, how that, how, how indigenous communities, when they hear about copyright and individual rights to, and individual ownership, is like, why? Like, how does that make sense? They, they really struggle with understanding that concept because we're part of a community as right. humans with each other and also as components of nature, whatever, like, you know, not the publisher, the, th the system. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think what you really also contributed magnificently to with ORCID um, is again, laying the foundation for a persistent identifier that enables an interconnected network for knowledge dissemination and accumulation 
and distribution. And so that everybody on the planet first researchers, but not only researchers, also other stakeholders can tap into of what we as researchers produce as knowledge and build up on each other's achievements for whatever purpose. And I've also, when in each course that I give as a trainer for early career researchers, I, I, I started asking them at some point, why did you become a researcher? Yeah. And oftentimes they, they respond, things like, oh, I'm naturally curious, and this is a profession that enables me to pursue that. But many people actually started a career to change the world to the better in one or the other aspects. And some just want to do basic research, and there's room for everyone, and everybody's contribution is, is valuable. Um, but I, I really think the majority is here for a purpose in this career. And then they lose it, like the second and third PhD students have to think hard to remember why they started this journey, yeah. finding them in a system, finding themselves in a system that's not healthy, really, or has become more and more challenging. Uh, yeah, where am I getting with this? But now, okay, to, it's not a harsh twist, but maybe like to round it all up. Um, now with your current stage of your career, Mm -hmm. um refer you've built uh something that you earlier um, shared with me reflects what you're really here for possibly to leave as a legacy or to also i mean we're not here to to leave anything just yet i mean but which combines the experiences you've made many of which you've shared with us um and now enabling others and facilitating organizations and a multitude of, of stakeholders for projects with Mighty Red Barn, bringing together that expertise that you've built as an individual in all these various career stages that you've described. Yeah, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to reflect on one thing that I've been like, I'm trying to figure out how to put this in, but is this idea like at, at ORCID, one of the questions I was asked over and over and over and over again is, you know, how many researchers are there in the world? Mm. And one of the things ORCID specifically did not do was, or intentionally did not do, was to not define researcher. Oh, okay, right? that's interesting. So we yeah. said anyone who feels that they would benefit from having this identifier that is researchy in some way, you know, it could be the research data librarian, it could be, you know, somebody in the grants office, it could be, somebody working at the bench, it could be somebody collecting in the field, it could be anybody who feels that they're part of the research community, right? And however you want to define that, you could get a research rating. We did not put a, a questionnaire saying you qualify for this. Mm. Um, and so that question of how many are there? And so I last year had the opportunity to work with a, a colleague of mine that I actually worked with when I was at the academies and then subsequently on some work at um, the NIH, one of the big projects we did was looking at um, who gets grants, right? And is there, a, is there a difference in whether or not you are awarded a grant at the NIH based on race, ethnicity, or gender, right? So this is one of these, you know, Lori is a troublemaker kind of projects because, you know, who wants to even ask that question, right? NIH was willing to ask that question. I mean, uh, it was a difficult one, right? And at the time, Raynard Kington was the acting director and he was like, I want the answer to this question. So NIH put some money behind the project and I had the absolute pleasure of being, you know, being the project director on this um, and, you know, found out that there actually was a serious difference between the number of, of African-Americans or blacks that get awarded research grants than whites, right? A, a mm. fairly substantial difference. Um, and, and then, you know, subsequent years and trying to figure out why is that the case? But the fact that NIH put the money into it and then set up some processes and experiments after that paper came out to say, okay, we've got a problem here. How are we going to address it? That is one of the high points of my career is doing that work, right? Mm. So anyways, right? I'm back working with Donnie Ginther, and the question this time was, how many researchers are there in the world? 
right? Well, how do you define research? Now you've got to actually define what this means and then figure out, you know, how are we going to collect the data? Right. And so, so this is, you know, that has been a really fun project to work on. And, um, and depending on how you define researchers, right? It's somewhere between, uh, I think we decided it was somewhere between 25 million and 90 million. Okay. That's right? quite a stretch. Right. And then you look at, for example, what has been happening at OECD and UNESCO, right? They've been, you know, they have the Frascati manual that defines all kinds of different terms, right? Who's at the table, right? Um, and in the 2015 timeframe, um, the definition of a researcher changed, right? To be much more inclusive. So it wasn't just somebody who has a master's or a PhD who is doing this kind of work, it became people who are contributing to our store of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so now you can have traditional knowledge folks coming in who may not have um, a quote unquote academic education, but are certainly part of knowledge generation in this world that we live in. And that really made me happy. Right, to see that that work, that definition is out there for us to be able to um, encompass all of the people that are part of understanding the world around us. Right. Mm. So then the, the next big part is, you know, how can these folks be counted, be included in what we're counting, right? Even that 90 million figure that we came up with, we cannot access traditional knowledge in the UNESCO databases yet, right? We're still looking at who works in a job that has some research component in it. That is kind of the way we went about looking at this or who has a higher, you know, a PhD or master's degree. So we, that 90 million doesn't include a lot of people. So you think about that and go, that's a big chunk of people on mm -hmm. this planet that could be and should be part of how we try to understand what is going on and how to start addressing, creating these experiments um, to address our societal challenge. Rather than one solution, there's going to be many, many solutions that are context dependent and that can be woven together through these communities. So I, I, I just love it. Um, working on this and it's, there's always this beginning part that time and the pain of setting up communities and getting people to talk to each other is, I've said it once, I'll say it, it's really difficult to do, mm. but it is absolutely necessary. And um, for folks like me and the entrepreneur side of things who love to deal with uncertainty, there are some great aspects of that, kind of bringing all these pieces together and trying to see if we can get some pieces to stick, but also this pain of the, the time I don't deal well with <laughs> stuff that goes slow. People have heard me say many, many times, I, I'm impatient, I get bored really easily. So this is a, it's a learning growth area for me it is I love building, bringing people together, but it's that, it's not even a maintenance phase. It's like this um, glue phase of getting this community to a place where it can work together mm. um, is exciting, hard, and um, I know it needs to be done, so I do it, but it's not, it's not always, it's, it's definitely not easy, but it's so, so fruitful when it works. Yeah, I think it, it requires a lot of fostering, really, like pampering and, you know, starting with a small group of people and re, like inviting and reinviting them back to the table and until they can start working on their own and be a community on their own. Exactly. Right. And I think that's that piece, right. Of saying as an entrepreneur, you have, and as a person who's been in these parts of the community, you can use those networks and entrepreneurial skills to bring folks together, bring that excitement in there. <clears throat> but then that like piece you said is at some point that entrepreneurial component, me, right. Being impatient, I'm not so helpful to that community anymore because my impatience can overwhelm 
the work that they need to do to generate respect. So I need to step away. And there have been multiple cases in my career where I've gotten to that point and said, okay, my work here is done. The community is working. And there are other people with different skill sets that come in or are already there as part of that community to take bring these help help support these communities into the next phase. Um, and I think that's also a big chunk of, uh, you know, understanding yourself. And with what I'm doing at Mighty Red Barn is also saying, this is who I know I am. This is the piece that I can contribute. Um, and just, yeah, I'm really, really happy. And I feel it's just a luxury to be able to do this work for me. I'm really, Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's, that's great to hear and sorry for the bark. Um, would you like, I think it's also looking at the time to come to a close, would you like to share a few sentences, if that's enough, and we can, mm -hmm. as mentioned, like, very well dive into other episodes in the future, mm -hmm. um, but just to close the circle of this conversation and so, like, the mighty red barn. Mm -hmm. to to maybe just like also pitch or explain to the audience like what why you created and how you created the mighty red barn um sourcing from all your experiences so far yeah yeah so what um you know where in in departing from orchid it was taking exactly what we were just talking about this idea that you know my role there was building I saw my role there as building the organization, getting it to a point with the community and with itself of financial stability and kind of community stability, right? So it could survive on its own. It didn't need me anymore. And I saw my role then as saying, okay, what is my next thing in that I can contribute? And this is where Mighty Red Barn came from is I am that person who helps at the beginning phase or at a transitional phase in an organization. So it could be a new a startup, it could be um, an existing organization that is realizing it needs to make a shift, right? And I can come in and help build communities of, to help understand what, what the community needs, what should be built, how it can be built, um, building communities practice to actually use this thing that's being built, help building teams. Um, so I guess you could almost call it product strategy um, is really what I work on. So it's that initial phase um, of understanding community need and what is it that this organization can do to service the community um, and then how long this organization needs to be doing this thing. If it becomes a community uh, organization itself, how long the entrepreneurs stay there, or if that organization is really in it for the long term, right? What does that look like and how does this thing sustain over time? So that's what I do. I'm doing some work with um, professional societies right now. Um, I have done that paper I just mentioned with, with Donna. Um, so there's some research components. Um, I have uh, work I'm doing with local contexts on um, thinking through the business model for the hub that they're developing that enables museums and indigenous communities to interact and label what's in these collections um, with appropriate kind of um, licenses, non-legal licenses from the indigenous communities to, to help with this um, indigenous data governance component. So a lot of these, like you said, socio-tech pieces, right, where there's a technical thing that's being built as part of a solution to an ongoing challenge of communities working together and using that tech as a way to enable, uh, enable or, or it's a lightning rod almost for conversations. So yeah, it's, um, so that's what I'm doing. It's, uh, I've been doing this for about 18 months and really, really, really enjoying it and looking forward to, you know, finding other opportunities and working with other communities on these kind of lightning rod, uh, mm -hmm. change projects essentially. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, um, the website for Mighty Red Bond is mightyredbond.com, one word. So, please check it out and yeah and what's left for me is thank you very much for sharing your stories really multiple thereof with us and um 
whenever there's a new project, a new paper out, a new chapter closed, let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm curious to see what's next on your timeline. And yeah, and let's keep up the conversation. All right. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for the opportunity. And this, I felt like was a, a good conversation. So I really enjoyed hearing um, your perspectives and your experiences as well. So thanks for sharing. Thank you.